meeting of the Finance Committee. Uh, before we get going, I want to thank and, and welcome again Councilors elect Shana Barnes and Shirley Azak for being here again tonight. Thank you very much. And then, Councilors, before we get into the agenda, it's the most wonderful time of the year again. The time for John Marion to come up and tell us all about the history of Santa and what's going on. One Mr. minute, though. Limited yeah. to one minute. <laughs> Mr. Marion, if you could take the rostrum. Thank you very much. Nice hat, John. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I, you know, I, I would have brought... Thank you very much, Council Cusa. I appreciate that. This is my co-host this year, Shana Bonds. Uh, I just want to say that I would have had more of these for you guys like I usually do, but this, they're in such demand this week that, you know, sorry. All right. I mean, you know. <laughs> we have ours at home, and we'll bring them, to the, we'll bring them next week. So tell us what, what's going on. Okay, so my annual report. This is our fifth year. When I started, I didn't need these glasses, but I got to get them on here. Okay, so five years ago, I didn't have these. So five years into this, we have connected uh, Brockton, Massachusetts with um, a lot of people, not only in the United States, but in the world. Last year, we did a simulcast with um, Ireland. They put a lot of resources into this. They put a lot of money into it, and they had a lot of people. And the last thing that was said to me live on the simulcast was, uh, it was raining over here, and when you folks in Brockton came up on the screen, a lot of people cried because they saw their brothers and sisters across the pond. So. This little thing that we've started um, with Santa hats to bring attention to uh, everybody about Brockton being the home of the first department store, Santa, this tradition that we've uh, embraced for now 123 years is starting to affect people, not only in our city, but around the world. And our city, I think, is understanding the, uh, the nature of why we're doing this and understanding that there's a rich history here. And everybody's embracing it, whatever ethnic or cultural background they may be from, they, they see the welcoming that the city of Brockton has to offer. And so today, I stand before you saying that I think that we're creating something that is beyond anything that we can present. And um, I spoke to a woman by the name of Carolyn Holland, and she's in Pennsylvania, and they're working out some sort of gadgetry that's going to hook us up with them on this Sunday, November 24th, which is when our Santa Hat Challenge is going to be. And there's a group of writers over there that heard about this. There's some connection with Brockton. And they want to, in some way, do a challenge back to us. So we don't have the technology quite set up the way we did last year, but we will talk to them either verbally or somehow just to acknowledge the fact that they have joined us in what we consider bringing people together on behalf of Mr. Edgar. Also, I just got off uh, Skype with a wonderful woman over in uh, Melbourne, Australia, and um, they're going to do something in a very small way themselves because um, it does take a lot to put something like this together. But we've communicated now for two years, and we're going to strive for our 125th anniversary, which is in 2015, to do something in a way that will surprise and, and make us feel good here, but surprise the world. And, and Melbourne will be involved in that. So... You folks, you need to be thanked, okay? The people out there listening should understand that this would never happen if it wasn't for the support of our city government here, which completely understands what the mission is. Um, in front of you, what we have, and I will let Chana talk about this a little bit because she's our co-host this year um, from 11 to 2 and had a lot to do with this entertainment, but we've brought in entertainers this year. So you want to talk about that a little bit? Thank you. Um, like John said, uh, Santa Hat Challenge, fifth year. We are bigger and better than ever this year. We're planning on going bigger and better uh, for the, at least the next two years to 125th. And this year, like John said, we have some special entertainment. We've had entertainment before, local entertainers. Now we're broadening it and, and doing uh, more of a national uh, entertainment section. So. And I believe you have the flyers in front of you. We have several multicultural entertainers here. Um, and we also have um, two particular that um, I think should be highlighted. The Seventh -day Advent Brockton Seventh-day Adventist School. They are going to have students come <coughs> excuse me, and uh, do sign language, Christmas carols and sign language. So we're reaching out um, also to that demographic. And um, one of Brockton's own... Brockton boy grew up here. Um, I went to school with him, actually. He's an R&B artist, um, you know, 
thousands or some amount of records sold, uh, Noel Gordine. And I'm pretty sure uh, some of you may know his family, uh, the Anderson family and Gordine family. So he has agreed to come back. And we've been in negotiation with him. He's excited to come. He has since moved to Huntsville, uh, Alabama, I believe. And, but he's, he's traveling all over the world, and he's going to make it here, traveling in that day to come to be able to perform um, and be our closeout act um, and do several of some Christmas songs and I believe some original songs he's going to do. Um, I encourage everyone out there to come. It's going to be, like I said, bigger and better this year. We're also uh, shooting for the, uh, another level of the Christmas hat uh, count this year. We hope for good weather. I'm putting that out there right now. Good weather. Uh, so that we can all be out there and have a great time. We're looking also to maybe have another layer of entertainment with some face painting and some things uh, geared for the kids. We're going to have um, also a health walk um, that's sponsored by the Old Colony Y. Uh, they're going to be doing that again this year. Uh, last year we had Radio Disney. I think we're, we're still trying to work on that. Um, and also the, there's going to be um, a tri tricycle race. Uh, that's going to happen as well, um, you know, before... Big wheel. Oh, Council Big Wheel. will represent the council. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, down the street, you know, to raise, um, raise funds for a worthy cause. So I just encourage everyone to please come out. Please take note of the flyer and the information that's here. Uh, John and I are very excited. That the whole uh, committee is very excited. Um, we've been meeting um, for several months now, in putting this together, and, and I'm very proud of him, very proud of his work, proud of his dedication to this mission, and proud um, to, to be associated with him in this endeavor. So thank you, John, for taking this on. Uh, this is a huge, 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 huge thing, so thank you. So the record 1,780 from last year. Okay, we want to break that and set a new one. We'll keep breaking it and setting a new one until we can't stand each other anymore. Um, the following week on Saturday... All right, our 27th annual holiday parade. You have the flyers, the posters, the corporate posters in front of you. All right, um, this year, one of the things that I take pride in, why I stay involved with this, not only because of having dedicated folks like Shana and the committee who's really representing the whole community now, but um, we are highlighting one of the, what I think is a great thing in Brockton, which is our education and our principals are our grand marshals. All of them are going to be in attendance. I heard we're going to get 100% attendance. Um, so this is truly a way to highlight our community. Once again, I want to thank all of you. I really do appreciate what you have done and how you're committed to the community. Folks out there have to know it. I'm saying it because it's true. Have a great night. I want to see you all there with your hats on. Also, the mayor, we want to thank her administration as well. She's been very supportive of this. And uh, as I said, if you don't come, we might lose the record. So come on. <laughs> Everybody has to come. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you very you, much John. for the work you do, and thank you. And I know most of us will be there. And uh, any questions except uh, actually I was looking at the flyer, and it's a little well, incomplete. I, I brought this to the chairman's attention, John. You might be able to answer it. I do not see the council cords on this <laughs> item. Is there a reason for that? No, I can, I can, I can, can, can I please? I understand that there was a conflicting engagement. You know, they're very, you know, they're, they're, they're much in demand, right? So I, I think, I think, Next I don't want to say it, but they're in some other community that day. I, am I, I don't know. No, I, don't I think know. the uh, budget wasn't high oh, enough. Oh, it wasn't high enough. All right. That's understandable. It's a budgetary that. thing, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thank you very much. And hopefully the Thank public you. will all be there. We'll see you at the parade also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Marion. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Clerk, item number one. Reappointment. Daniel L. Campbell, 16 Belter Ave, Brockton, as a constable in the city of Brockton for a term of three years. Invited Daniel L. Campbell. Uh, Mr. Oh, there he is. Okay, thank you. I wasn't sure. You can step right forward. Any questions, counselors? Motion to approve. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is approved. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Thank you. Item number two. Order appropriation $4,500 from the unappropriated estimated receipts to the auditor's office fund deficit recovery in order to provide funding to eliminate minor deficits in several special revenue funds prior to setting the tax rate. I invited John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Heidi A. Chuckran, Auditor. And Council, uh, uh, Ms. Chuckran has had a little setback in her health and isn't going to be here tonight. She's doing okay but not going to be here tonight, but I think Mr. Condon can answer any questions on this. Councillor Brophy. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Ms. Connor. Could you just explain the reason for the appropriation? 
Yes, uh, basically before you can set the tax rate, the Department of Revenue requires the city to have cleaned up any deficits from the prior fiscal year closing which may exist. This year there were a couple of funds, uh, some of the special revenue funds which had small deficits. There were several of them, but in the aggre aggregate they only come to $4,500. Most of them are like $300 here, $400 there. It used to be that when we set the tax rate, the, the Department of Revenue would simply let us add that in if it was a small dollar amount, but now they want to see an actual appropriation for it. So that's why we're here. Excuse me. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion made to second and recommend, recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you, councilors. Thank you. You can stay right there. Item number three. Order appropriation $300,000 from the unappropriated estimated receipts of the water fund to stabilization fund in order to reserve for cost of the water utility which are not directly paid by its budget. Invited John A. Conant, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Thorson, Commissioner of DPW. Uh, by the way, Councilors, I have a, a letter from uh, Commissioner Thorson that he was unable to attend tonight. He had a previous engagement, but I believe uh, Mr. Conant can probably answer all of these questions also. Councilor Brophy. I'm just going to ask the same question. Yes. Uh, basically, it. when the council adopted the budget in June, they made a reduction of $300,000 from water revenues, which were asked to be appropriated to uh, the desalination contract for purposes of variable uh, purchases, not the fixed dollar amount, but for variable purchases. So what we're asking here is that that money that was cut because the budget was balanced on the revenues with that money in there be instead appropriated to the stabilization fund. The reason for this is that the water revenues weren't adequate in the budget to pay for all the costs that are carried in the general fund on its behalf, health cost of 600000 plus, dental another 15000 pension cost about 600000 and an allocation of uh, administrative overhead of about 300000 There are others as well, but the only amount that was appropriated was $600,000. The total that needed to be appropriated to fully reimburse the general fund is $2.2 million. So our request is that if you're not going to appropriate this for the water uh, contract variable rate purchase, that instead we put it into the stabilization fund because there, there can be used to take care of those expenses with a later appropriation. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Any other questions? Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably to the full city council. Uh, item number four. Order appropriation of $1.9 million from the unappropriated estimated receipts to the stabilization fund in order to fully appropriate the city's fiscal year 2014 estimated revenues prior to the property tax classification here. And I invited John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Paul Sullivan, Chairman, Board of Assessor. Okay, Councilors, this is slightly different, and I guess you're going to want an explanation. You <laughs> so we might as well just jump right into it. Uh, basically, every year when we do the budget, we make an estimate of the tax revenues, which is usually low on the basis of the estimated uh, receipts from uh, new growth, uh, because you can't estimate high and have it appropriated and find out that you haven't got that money in actuality. So this year we've got, typically we have 900 to a million, 900,000 to a million dollars. We do, again, this year. The estimate in the budget was for $500,000 of prop two and a half new growth, not the two and a half levy increase, but new growth. And the actual amount is going to come in at about $1.4 In addition to that, the City Council made budget cuts of about $750,000. And there were estimates in the budget that there would be deficits. We always reserve in case there are some large deficits, such as snow and ice. That was, uh, that's another source of it. So in total, is about $1.9 million which needs to be appropriated or else it won't be levied. So your choice is basically if you accept this recommendation, you will be making an appropriation to the stabilization fund, which is currently at a balance of about $2 million, and this would increase it by $1.9 million. If you don't make this appropriation, the taxes don't get levied. It's the same uh, de decision that the council had in front of it last year. Uh, my recommendation would be to make the appropriation because I don't think the stabilization fund is adequate at $2.2 million. We still have union contracts that have not been settled with all of the uh, unions except for the fire union. The police union itself is looking back four years at this point. So that's, that's my recommendation. Motion to recommend favor. Mr. Second. Uh, actually, before I take your motion, Council so, Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Condon, uh, so, so just based on what you just said, so the union contracts for the firefighters, that amount that we discussed pretty extensively earlier, that amount has been paid out already? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, and we're anticipating then that an agreement with the 
police union, if it were similar to the firefighters agreement, would deplete the fund by $2 million. So we're talking about, with this move, having $2 million left in the stabilization fund. That would help, it would help to pay for that. And I, I need to say to you, though, that uh, we are not in agreement with the police union. We were at the table, uh, but we had not come to a conclusion. Uh, as a result of the new election, even had we come to a conclusion at the table, absent a funding vote by the city council, uh, that agreement wouldn't be binding on the new mayor. So basically it's, it's a bit of a new game. I don't know where Mary elect Carpenter would stand on, on any of these issues. I think we have some suspicion based on some of the campaign positions. But nonetheless, the police contract is unsettled since fiscal 10. So some amount of money is going to have to be directed to them at some point. And the other unions, uh, except for the fire, have contracts which have expired as of June 30, just passed. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Item number five. Order appropriation of 100000 from the unappropriated estimated receipts of the general fund to the general fund revenue subsidy of the Parks Recreation Enterprise Fund, 50000 and from unappropriated revenues of the Park Recreation Enterprise to the Park Rec Recreation Enterprise Personal Services other than overtime, 50000 in order to provide funding for the staffing of an additional general foreman and maintenance man of the Park Commission in order to boost the subsidy of the general fund to the Park Recreation Enterprise Fund so that the appropriations of the fiscal year 2014 budget can be sustained at current levels. Invited John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Timothy Carpenter, Superintendent of Parks and Recreation. Uh, Good evening, Mr. Condon. Uh, Council's associate of this is also balancing out the final appropriations. That's a little bit different in this case. Uh, uh, Mr. Carpenter is looking for an additional general foreman in his budget. I think he feels he needs it. I would agree with that. And in addition, when we looked at the final revenues, most of our estimated receipts for this year were conservatively estimated, but on the park side it was a, a little different matter so that uh, the park's budget gets a gen general fund subsidy. This would improve increase that subsidy and then direct some of that increase to the hiring of the general fund foreman. I read the recreation foreman. Council Stewart. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, questions about uh, this particular position. So what is the annual salary amount of this person and how do you plan to sustain that position beyond this specific appropriation? Um, currently the salary for the general foreman's position yes. at the golf course is approximately $54,000. Um, and I'm hoping that, um, I mean, obviously the goal is always to improve conditions, um, especially on a golf course. The better your conditions, the more play you're going to have. Um, and having someone in position to help me implement my vision on an, you know, eight hours a day basis um, would be a huge help to what I think is improving what the golf course. And hopefully the uh, increased revenue from that sustains the position. I see. And, and is, so is this a one-year ag agreement with this individual? How does that work? I, don't um, I hope that it will not be. I mean, this is a position that I feel is, um, is very important to the functioning of the golf course. Uh, things on a golf course change really in the matter of hours. Um, what you see in the morning could be completely different by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and having someone with trained eyes there to see things before they go downhill is really extremely important. Okay, and then what's the process for recruiting this individual? Is it, have you identified the person already or is it um, going to go out we and... We haven't specifically identified anyone quite yet. Um, you know, there are some um, training requirements and some licensing requirements that I feel are very important. Um, and if those are met, then, you know, I'd like to be able to hire someone. Okay, and are you working with the personnel department on this? In Absolutely. Terms? Uh, because I just want to make, I mean, I, my typical line is I, I'm hoping that we'll be really aggressive in marketing the position to as a wide array of individuals as possible and it's not part of an in, inside kind of selling practice just out of fairness to all who may be interested and qualified. Mm -hmm. You agree? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Carpenter. Good evening. Is this position a working foreman's position? Correct. So he'll, he'll be dry, like you said, he'll be licensed for heavy equipment operating tractors and cutting grass and all that stuff? Well, currently the, any of the equipment that we have up there um, doesn't require, the only thing that requires licensing up there is, a ba is basically the spraying. The spraying? Yeah. For the, okay. Now, how many people will he be overseeing at the golf course? A uh, staff of three. 
So, okay, so there's three plus himself. Correct. But I was more concerned that, you know, some people say, well, a foreman doesn't really work. You know, they oversee, but this is a working foreman's job. Well, I mean, a, a large portion of his job, obviously, will be overseeing. Um, but, you know, when things get tight. No, I understand. I, I visited the golf course. I yeah. visited the golf course a couple of weeks ago, and it, you know, I, I'm agreeing with you. You need some help to to get it going, to spruce it up, so we can get more players and more revenue. That's the way it works. Yep. So I, I want to thank you, and I, I'm, I'm I'm in support of you looking for another position for this foreman's job. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion to recommend favor. Second. Councilor Ian Erie. If I might, just a couple of quick uh, questions. Uh, so, Mr. Carpenter, who's been uh, who's been pretty much like filling the void right now? Um, you know. Excuse me. I'm very sorry. Um, and, uh, who's been filling the void uh, at this particular time? Um, so, to a large extent, it's been myself. Okay. So it's it's it obviously it's a new position and. and uh, I can't disagree with uh, what you're uh, what you're saying in regards to having the position and how it can, in, uh, you know, improve the um, the quality of the golf course and the quality of life to the fact that we'll have more more revenue. Um, but I, I also agree with uh, Councilor Stewart that I want to make sure that we aggressively, you know, make sure that when it does go out for um, for, the, for the process of uh, advertisement and, and the people that you know, Phil, that we're, we're on the right track to the person that we do have and make sure that he has the proper training that you say he, he definitely, definitely needs. But uh, I, I think it's a great positive, um, you know, that, that we fill a position like that so that we can uh, keep things moving ahead. So I appreciate you, you know, bringing this before us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now I'll take your motion. Motion to recommend favor. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably to the full City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Item number six. Ordered that the City Council authorize the approval of the solar net metering credit agreement between 126 Grove Solar LLC and the City of Brockton, a copy of which is attached here too. This agreement is for the purchase of solar power from a solar plant which will save the City in electricity costs. Invited John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Caitlin Leach, Assistant City Solicitor, Michael Thorson, Commissioner of DPW, Brian Morrissey, Citizens Energy. Uh, Councilors, uh, Councilors before you do, I have a letter from uh, Ms. Leach, our Assistant City Solicitor, who had a previous engagement. And uh, she does say if her presence is needed at a future date on this, please advise her. But I think Mr. Condon can probably answer any questions. Mr. Condon. Uh, first, I'd like to correct an error in, in the invitation, uh, not in the order itself, but in the invitation. The uh, individual invited was uh, Kurt Mayland from uh, Soltis, which is the owner of the Grove Solar Project, not Brian Morrissey, which was a previous solar project we had before the City Council. So it's Kurt Malin, and Mr. Malin is with us tonight. I'm sorry, I think that was probably my fault. So in any case, uh, so basically he can describe this uh, contract in, in greater detail, but it's very, very similar to the two contracts which have already been approved by the Council with New Gen and then later with uh, Citizens. And it's for 20 years for us to purchase the solar output from a solar, uh, a solar farm, which generates a little bit less than two megs a year, we're thinking. The cost to the city, it will generate about $28,000 worth of electricity. The cost to the city to purchase that will be about $20,000, and the $8,000 difference will be applied to the uh, uh, city's electric bills on other accounts, thereby saving the city about $8,000 a month. This is the same as the basic concept as the other contracts, which are being uh, helped by the state's policy that they want to have more green, green energy. Therefore, these projects are being subsidized at the state level, and that, that creates this, uh, this advantage. So it's, uh, it's a project which is, uh, the contract was just, just concluded, and I think uh, Mr. Malin can describe the company and the project for you. Thank you very much. Mr. Malin. Thank you very much. I'll be brief. I know there's a Patriots game this evening. Um, and I believe the package described most of um, what we're proposing and who we are. We're, you know, we're a solar developer in the, in the state of Massachusetts. We're one of the biggest. We've Thank got, um, we'll soon have close to 18 megawatts um, under construction. Importantly, our two biggest projects up in uh, Orange and Athol, we've, we've done a similar deal with the city of Lowell, which has already commenced. Um, the economics of this deal, which are actually uh, more favorable uh, to Brockton than, than, than Lowell is receiving. Um, as indicated by Mr. Condon, this, the power coming um, 
Well, the net metering credit is coming to the city of Brockton. will come from a power plant in Franklin, Massachusetts. It's one of the largest rooftop installations in the state. It's uh, about 2.2 megawatts DC, about 1.75 AC. Um, I mean, the important piece, I'm guessing, to you all will be on the back page, which is the, which is the economics, which Mr. Condon hit on briefly. Um, basically, we're offering um, a 30 percent reduction in the electricity bills um, based on the amount of uh, net metering credits we're providing. The economics are actually slightly better right now since National Grid recently raised their G1 rate to approximately 17 cents a kilowatt hour, up from about 14. So we're estimating now that the savings to the city should be approximately $123,000 per year instead of 96. And on that one, two, three, four, fifth line on that back page, it should read 0 0.051. There's a typo there times 2.4 million um, kilowatt hours, which gets you to the $123,000 of savings. Um, and that's essentially the economics. It, the, the, in practice, it works exactly the same as, as your other agreements. We simply place net metering credits onto a dedicated bill. Um, you keep 30 percent and send the 70 percent back to us, which is how we uh, are able to finance projects like these. Questions? Motion to recommend favor. Council Dubois. Um, so that's how it's billed. How, how can you just explain it one more time for me, the whole process, just one sure. more time? Sure. It's, it's, it's a little bit funky. Um, it's interesting. I, I, just, I have it, the notes written down, but I want to... Right. So the best way to describe it is um, if you have a solar facility on your roof at your house, it, it simply provides power to your house, so you're not paying as much monthly to National Grid because you're taking a lot from those solar panels. This is a little bit different in that we're sort of a standalone facility. And what we're doing is essentially... Um, producing a certain amount of um, net metering credits, which are equivalent to um, the electrical output. And here, we're looking at producing 2.4 million kilowatt hours per year, or 2.4 million net metering credits. And the value of that net metering credit right now is about 17 cents. So um, that amount will appear on a dedicated electric bill as a, simply a cash credit. And so you're going to keep 30 percent of that cash credit, and you're going to return 70 percent to us. Um, it's essentially, it's a, it's, a, it's a fancy way of, of, of laundering money. We don't have a, we don't have a use for the 2.4 million kilowatt hours. We don't have any facilities in the state that use that. You do, so we can give it to you, and you can return a chunk to us and keep a bit yourselves, and that's how you reduce your bills. Thank you. Okay. May I ask Jay a question? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Jay, can you explain it all again, just one more time? Yes. Thank yeah, you. Ba basically, the, um, the city contracts with this company which owns the solar field to buy its output. <clears throat> when we buy the output, what we are purchasing gets applied to our, some of what we're purchasing gets applied to our <laughs> national grid electric bill. So that bill gets reduced. So the amount that we're paying to them Soltas is less than the amount that the, of the credit. So the, the difference between the two is a benefit to the city in its electric bill. We're buying the whole output as it gets, as it, as it gets created, and the amount we pay to Soltas has a value to us which is showing up on our electric bill, which is worth about 30 <coughs> percent of the output value of the solar field. Which is what cost? Uh, it's probably going to cost us... Um, Twenty mm, something thousand dollars a month. Say it again. I'm sorry. Twenty twenty thousand more. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. But Thanks. we're going to be getting twenty eight thousand dollars in credit, so that That's the difference great. is the savings. Okay. Thank you very much. May I ask, um, what is the name of your company? Uh, Soltus Energy. Can I ask you, um, Soltus Energy? How, how, where else do you do this? Um, we have a facility in Tennessee. We've got um, two large ground mounts in uh, Athol and Orange, Massachusetts. They're three megawatt facilities. We've got numerous in Lawrence uh, rooftops, 700, uh, 750 kW, a 500 kW, another in West Brookfield, um, another in um, 202 High Street in Gardner, Massachusetts. We have about 12 megawatts operating. We're doing a large one in Brimfield, a six megawatt cool. right now. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion to recommend favor. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you very much. Item number seven.
Resolved. The following department managers are invited to appear, appear before the City Council to provide an overview of their departmental policies, past practices with relation to City employees arrested and or charged with violent crimes or drug offenses. Director of Personnel Maureen Cruz, Chief of Police Manuel Gomes, Chief of the Fire Department Richard Francis, and Superintendent of Utilities Larry Raleigh. Invited Emilio Gomes, Chief of Police, Richard Francis, Chief of Fire, Maureen Cruz, Director of Personnel, Lawrence Raleigh, Superintendent of Utilities. And councils, I received a call just before the meeting. Uh, Mr. Rowley's mother was rushed to the hospital. Oh, no. He's not going to be able to make it tonight. Good evening, Ms. Cruz. Good evening, okay. councillors. Uh, I'd like to address, take any questions. As indicated, Mr. Rowley is not here. Um, Ms. Cruz, Ms. Cruz, can I just, can I introduce it? I'm sorry. You, you may, my fault. Council Dubois. And that's okay. And I really appreciate your time and you being here because you're going to be able to help a lot. So I've, I've just, I filed this to know the general laws of um, the city or what practice we, we follow in these instances. So are you going to explain what the, what the policies are that the city imp implements? I'm going to, yes. Wonderful. Great. So if and when an employee is uh, charged with any kind of crime, obviously they are union employees and civil service employees. So they have rights under employ employment contracts and civil service regulations. We look, we take each and every case seriously. We look at the position that the employee holds in which department and we determined the best course of action that would protect the employee's rights, the other employees that they work with, and the citizens of the city of Brockton. And we take a variety of different steps from anywhere from uh, reassignment of the employee so that they are not out in the public or uh, paid up to paid administrative leave. But again, we can't just take action of suspension or termination because it's not job related and we would uh, lose any action in that avenue if we took that action. So we go anywhere from reassignment of an employee to paid administrative leave until there is a further determination based either on the charges being dropped or if there is further um, criminal action, then we would uh, look, review the situation and determine whether termination is necessary, but those would be the avenues that we would look at. Hopefully that answers many of your questions. I just have some follow-ups, but I appreciate it. Where is this written, what you just said? Where is it a written policy of the city that that's our process? I'm just wondering. There is no written policy. Okay, no written policy. Okay. No. Because you have to follow civil service guidelines sure. regarding any disciplinary action and collective bargaining agreements. Don't you think that that could be in a policy? that what you just said, that sentence, and then you could still have a policy on if an employee gets arrested for even a violent crime or a drug offense that they would have to self-report? You'd have to bargain any of that, those policies with the employees. I know EMTs are required by law to self-report, and once they self-report... There are, Counselor, in some of the collective... But did you know about that? I'm just wondering. Uh, we don't have EMTs, so... So, no? I just an emergency responder because EMTs are emergency well, responders. Well, some of our collective bargaining so agreements sense. have certain regulations regarding different um, stipulations that they have to self-notify on certain actions, but not many of the contracts. Can you say that one more time? What did you say? I'm sorry. What did you just say? There are a couple of contracts that have language within the contracts that do require self-notification, but it, uh, they are not related to... Uh, the types of criminal charges that you are talking, you are referring to. Can you to. talk more about the self, what, what instances those are in the contracts? In most, in most cases, it's loss of license. So a couple of contracts that have requirements, <clears throat> tell me if I'm wrong, um, that have requirements to self-report. Correct. And who do they self-report to? Their department head. So they would report to the department head, report to department head. And where is that, where would that be written down? In, in the collective employee? bargaining agreement. So in the collective, not an employee manual. Okay. No. Collective bargaining agreements. Okay. Do they have employee manuals each department that, that something like no, this? No, the collective like bargaining agreements are what are really considered the manuals. So there are no like job, like duties that are, that are in a, 
that are in some kind of job description when you when you add well, a job description wouldn't have self reporting on criminal charges it wouldn't because I know EMT requirements their state requirements require them to do certain things so I what employees and I guess this might be for the fire chief or the police chief my other question so I'll hold that for them I appreciate that so um, so what are the city's policies on employee arrests do you have them written down anywhere because as I indicated counselor each case is reviewed on a case by case basis ba depending on the employee job title and the charges that have been filed and this is your report to me but it's not written down anywhere so the next department head that's the human resources um, lead could interpret it differently because we don't have it written down anywhere don't you think we should write it down don't you think that would just be a good idea? Other communities have that written down, policies, you know. Well, would I, that be something you'd be interested in? Because I'm kind of interested in it, because I'm concerned not so much if someone, well, just, just so I can be clear, for, just so you know, and you can tell me either that isn't really in your realm, or, or I don't know, because you'll know more about it than I do. But if someone were to be arrested, say, for, I don't know, disturbing the peace in some kind, I, I can't be the judge on what I, I as a public taxpayer would want to know about because I want to follow exactly what you say that everybody has their own rights to privacy and must be afforded respect and privacy when these issues happen we don't want to ruin someone's totally life but in the same breath if it if we have an employee that is welcomed into people's homes like an EMT is at the state level and has to have bring with that the gravitas of the position that they're entering someone's home as a savior and if there is a possible um, tarnish on that person by way of a serious offense such as a drug offense or a violent crime or a sexual assault or anything like that I would think that the person that I represent sitting at the Brookfield Campanelli who owns their home and is an older person wants to feel comfortable that anyone that's coming into their house isn't um, there there isn't even a possibility that there's any charge against that person for them to feel safe what if it was a drug offense and this person had some kind of a drug addiction and they're going into your grandmother's house and she has drugs in her medicine cabinet and there's an arrest out there about that so certain certain um, arrests I think the in certain positions the public needs to know about if they're sitting in an office and they're never alone with people I can understand what you just said to me being enough but since there are positions that are given this real um, real entree into the private homes of our citizens we should know that counselor if we took action and reassigned or uh, terminated an employee we would end up in a case where we could number one jeopardize the um, employees rights to a fair trial and punitive damages for taking action against that employee and it could be as much as uh, back pay and uh, interest paid to that employee and I understand everything that you said from the context of it being um, someone that works in the assessor's department or the finance department or the mayor's office that aren't going into the intimate realms of people's homes m unsupervised um, and that's why I also ask the, the folks that have people that work in the water sewer um, departments to come in and talk about it because it's not so much that I'm worried about people that don't get that privilege but the people that do if there are those concerns I think before the people should know that that's a potentiality so that's why I was hoping that maybe um, you and I or some community group or maybe the wage and personnel board which is another part of my question could come up with a really broad policy that gives general parameters that are respectful to anyone's privacy but also requires some sort of reporting to the city if someone that is in that type of role that gets access to people's homes they get put on uh, paid administrative leave while the process is underway something until there's some decision of the court because until then I would think that that employee would feel weird about what's going on in their lives that they might need a break to figure that out I mean and it could so well, I, I if that's again if but not my judgment 
if an employee feels they need time off, they have vacation time to request time off. They have personal leave to take if they so desire. If they feel that they can't continue to work, they can request a leave of absence. However, we cannot force them to take a leave of absence. That's considered a suspension. And without a proper hearing for that employee, that can't be accomplished. Okay. So we do take the appropriate action against any employee who is charged. They're either reassigned or up to paid administrative leave pending a decision on the charges okay. at hand. So they're still re the reassigned is great as the, as the baseline. So if they are um, in intimate settings with vulnerable people, they'd be reassigned to something that didn't have them in that position? Again, each, it's taken on a case-by-case -case basis. So no, it no doesn't hard and fast. It, no, it, no hard and fast rules on that. So there are no, there are no employee re reporting requirements no requirements that are assigned them to report an arrest for domestic violence, sexual assault, drug charges, gang we charges, have, we gun have charges. We have a domestic policy. Um, so you, you, you're so we do have a domestic policy. Okay. Yes, we do. And does that require them to report after a, an alleged arrest? Or what is that? Oh, will you outline that for me? Uh, I didn't bring that policy, and I don't have all the facts of that policy off the top of my head tonight, Council. But could you give me like counsel. an overview of it? Because it's kind of related. Where I said violent crime or assault, I would think that you would have brought that in. Just like an overview of what our policy is, because I at, I'm just wondering, do you have any idea about it? Just like an overview. I won't hold you to it. Councilor, I'd, I'll forward it to you. I'd rather not answer okay, without, that, you without know what, having it in front of me. That is very fair. And I think a couple people that I wanted to come invite um, aren't here, so I'll put it back when I try to postpone this. If you wouldn't mind, maybe you could look it up and send it to us, and maybe if any of my fellow counselors had questions or I had more questions about it, I could just ask you it then, and then we could just move on to the new year with a whole new set of priorities. Certainly. I would really appreciate it. I don't want to give anybody a hard time. It's, I'm just really concerned from a constituent's point of view what would happen to their grandmother in one of those Campanelli. Counselor, or we take it like seriously. We take it very know? seriously, Counselor. I want, to, I want to reassure them. We reassign people. We do not put people in jeopardy of sending them into a citizen's home that would jeopardize a citizen. We and take it very seriously. I appreciate and we, that. And we take it seriously when we have employees who are randomly drug tested and there is an issue with them. We handle all of them and that's in the drug and alcohol policy and I'll send you a copy of that as well. So that's written down. That it is because so that's a federal law. Nice. I think that's great. So there is a drug that's policy. That's for CDL licensed drivers. There's a domestic violence policy. That's correct. So like I would like to learn more about those types of policies that put to those types of protective measures um, onto employees that protect the public and the taxpayers and the person's grandmother living at her, on, her, on her own. And so I'm wondering, in your opinion, do you think that the research of this and the study of what kind of protective policies the city should enact should be taken on by a wage and personnel board? Do you think that that would have been one of their potential roles? No, that would not have been no. one of their potential roles. So their salary. They don't set policies for okay. employees in the city of Brock. I thought they were They don't even here. set policies for uh, union employees. They set salaries for non-union employees. Exactly. And they haven't met in a long time. And I, I just wasn't sure if there was wiggle they wouldn't room have in any, that they, definition. It wouldn't be in, within their domain to do. So who would, how would we go about putting together some kind of group to look into it? Um, how, would, would that be something that you and I met about and maybe came up with an ordinance that created some kind of study group to look at what other communities do and maybe enact some well, measures? Well, you might want to speak to Mayor-elect Carpenter to see what his intentions and would be. I will. But, but any ordinance could not be just implemented. If it is something that affects the work and conditions of an employee, sure. it must be bargained with all union members. I think that's, oh, well, couldn't, you can have different contracts with each union. So you but could if you're changing yeah. their working conditions, which any new policy sure. is a change in working conditions, you would have to bargain that with each collective bargaining unit. So you would have to bargain it with the ones, so you, I would think uh, the police and the fire, 
anyone in the school DPW. department, DPW. School department, we would have nothing to do with counseling. No, and they're excellent over there. They, they get it under control because they have all these state regulations to report these types of things. They, they can't, teachers don't just get arrested. Teachers aren't the only ones that are employed at the school department, Ex counselor, with all due respect. Oh, oh, exactly true, exactly true. So it will be interesting to learn more about that, but I'm happy that our teachers that are in those intimate settings do have those requirements because I just think it's more protective. So I'm happy about that. So I'm thinking maybe um, when you come back, we can talk about the policies that the city already has in place um, and then maybe come up with some kind of idea of on how we can get a group together to look at other communities that have these policies. I would like to file something on that in the new year and it doesn't have to be something that gets done in you know three readings of this group but I would like to have some kind of dialogue about creating an ordinance because I think it's important that gives some kind of guidance and protection to the public that they feel comfortable with and that you feel comfortable with that also respects the employee and also respects the individuals that that employee may come into contact with in their private homes. Uh, counselor, you, you have the right to create an ordinance. Just yeah. remember when you create that, that it would, it must be bargained with the employees. Sure, sure. Just like residency, right? Correct. Exactly. And, but and what remember, I'm thinking... And remember, uh, I was here for residency. That cost the city a lot of money to get that in the collective bargaining agreements. Yeah. I understand so. what you're saying there, but from my perspective, and I could be wrong, we would have to see. If we were to put something on the books that was respectful and that the chiefs of the fire and the, and the police, both and the mayor and everyone that feels on the city side they have an important say on the issue or does have an important say on the issue, feels yeah, comfortable with it, then we could enact something and wouldn't that be a good bargaining tool for our, for our behalf? Because we're, we wind up giving employees raises anyways, let's just be honest, we do. And when we do, this type of requirement not only helps the resident, it also helps the employee because it makes them not have to feel uncomfortable going into a difficult situation with someone who also either is A, worried about some kind of crazy false claim against them or B, is guilty of the, false, the true claim against them, I don't know. But maybe that gives um, solace to the, their fellow employees when they have to go into these dangerous situations that they have a potentially admiral and upstanding citizen alongside them, even if they know they are anyways. So you take the personality out of it. So that's why the EMTs do it. I'm going to ask the chiefs if they do it, but maybe, does this sound like something you'd be interested in? I'm always open to suggestions, Counselor. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for your time. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. Could I ask um, uh, Chief Francis to come up? I really appreciate you coming here, Chief Francis. Counselor, since, since you went down a path that you did here, okay? Thank you. First of all, do you trust me as a department head that I would turn around and let anybody on my trucks responding to any calls, any type of calls that had any kind of any personal problem going on? I would think no. I'm pretty outraged right now that yeah. you, you went down that path because well, that's some, the only someone's thing I care sitting about. out in the public somewhere, some elderly person's going to wonder now. I know. All right? I know. Okay? I had, if you had no, faith, won't. if you had complete faith in me, then that wouldn't be an issue. I have faith in you. I really do have complete faith in you and your position. No but one in my department has ever turned around and gone into any uh, house, business, or anything else that had anything, ha any personnel problem hanging over their head. I think that's great. And so my question um, was, I don't. I, you know, I can't recall if you were part of the email request or not, but I had sent an email request just asking for basic policies around what happens if someone's arrested. I remember when I think it was uh, Mayor Harrington was in office, um, someone that works here got arrested for a drug offense and there was a big hoopla in the media about it. And and I remember it and the public remembers it. And so then when I saw something else and I was concerned, it had nothing to do with any individual group of persons. What it had to do with is I got some calls from people that were concerned about what happens in those situations and I tried to get an answer for them. And when I asked that question, I wasn't given the, any, any written information on anything about anything. And I didn't think to go, I don't even know if I went to you or Chief Gomes and you can tell me when you come up 
if I did or not. I think I just went to the administration because I didn't see it as an issue with individual departments. I saw it that the city should have some kind of very broad protective structure that doesn't put it on any person's reputation on how they handle it at the most basic level of just like you said the person's probably totally innocent or I don't care but they're taken out of that situation and respected in whatever manner you see fit I'm fine with all I wanted to know was those basic requirements were undertaken in positions where the employee gains access to someone's intimate home in a trusted manner. Like EMTs have to self-report, and when they self-report, the state takes away their license until the matter is, is cleared up. Council, I, I just gave you my answer. So right. that, that's your department policy, and it's not written down. Would you, be, would you be willing to not take any authority away from you because you know, you don't become the chief without deserving authority and decision-making skills. So I don't mean to disrespect you at all, but just on the broader sense of it, having some requirements for departments that have employees who access people's homes, it, would you be willing to, like, sit on some discussion group on the value of that ordinance? Um, I would have to see where the city's going to go with all of this. Of course, yes. I think that's fair, but you wouldn't be opposed to it. I haven't given it that much thought. Okay. In that, in, in that regard, okay. Yeah. My, 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 my main concern tonight is the fact that someone sitting out there is going to wonder now, and it just made my job and, and, the, and the people that work for me, their jobs a lot harder now because everybody's going to wonder. Yeah, but the thing is, it's already out there, and it, it, they were probably already wondering before because I got phone calls about it. So there were people wondering about what happens because there's this crazy newspaper that follows salacious stuff like it's TMZ or something, and they put it out there like it's the biggest news of the day, and then you have people that only have that as their resource or their main resource, and they're really living in... Um, an environment where they're home a lot, maybe they're seniors, that they have these concerns. And I'm really happy that you're here tonight, and it's obvious that you've allayed those concerns to me, and I think anybody that were to see this on the television, that, you know, you... you I, it is what it is, Council. Of course, of course. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask to postpone this till Kate, uh, a city solicitor, Leach, can come in and just tell us what she thinks about it, but that isn't anything, if it gets postponed, you would have to come back on unless you felt like you wanted to, because like I said to... Um, uh, Ms. Cruz, I would like to, um, in the new year, in the new term, come up with some group that looks at some kind of very broad, wide-arching protection in instances like this. And I think that it would be really bad if you weren't part of that. Um, well, like process. I say, my main concern right now is just to reassure the citizens that there's nothing going on, all right? And I think that's great. Okay. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chief Gomes, could you come up to the podium? Sure. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. Good evening. Do you have, so, um, are employees required to self-report if they are arrested for a violent crime, sexual assault, or drug offense in the Brockton Police Department? Uh, they are as far as a standpoint where there's some mandates, uh, even motor vehicle offenses, that would require a loss of license, as you know. Having a uh, valid Massachusetts driver's license is, is a requirement of the police. Um, so even minor things like that, we would follow up. We also have a, uh, a full-time internal affairs division that follows up uh, on everything. Anything that we get from other departments, uh, we follow up on rumors, anything at all. Uh, we're, we're very quick to get on those kinds of things. Who's on the internal affairs department? Is that public information? Who's that? Yeah. Maybe there's, not individual, or you could tell individual. Yeah, there's, there's, a sergeant, there's a sergeant and a detective that work um, in internal affairs on a full-time basis. They handle all uh, civilian complaints and any uh, special investigations so ordered by the chief of police. Oh. So the chief of the police can in, have this group investigate anything they want, any, any, any rumor about an employee we, or an arrest. We, you yes, we, we get to the bottom of it. Um, sometimes the, sometimes mm -hmm. the rumor causes more harm than the actual event. 
So it's necessary to protect the, uh, the interests of the city and the department by following those things up. So if someone were, okay, so first off, if a police officer was arrested for sexual assault, abuse, gun charge, drug charge, drunk driving charge, how do you find out about it? Well, it depends on where the arrest takes place. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you're talking uh, specific events. If any, any no kind specific of specific events. Right. Any arrest. In general. Any arrest takes place, uh, we would find out, and we would immediately take administrative action. See, in the situation that we're in. What if it was in Barbados? Our personnel. How would you find out? That's what I'm just wondering. Or what if they're in Florida? Do you find out? Is we're, there a self-reporting requirement of the employee on their behalf to let you the, know? The employee, the employee when, when we have had off-duty uh, issues, now you're talking about there's, there's work-related issues yeah. and there's off-duty non-work-related exactly. issues. Yes. Okay. There's, we're also talking about, the, the, and, you know, going back to what I told you about the internal affairs, we, we even look at all kinds of uh, misconduct, whether it's criminal or not. See, we have rules Even and for off duty. Yeah, we have, we have right. We have rules and regulations within the department, and officers are held accountable even to misconduct, even if it's non-criminal but takes place off duty. So it's a busy department, right? If you're just following. No, up, actually, actually, the busy. men and women of the Brockton Police Department are, are exemplary, and I have very few events. I really do. Good. So what about? So they don't do investigations for like the whole city employee department. Uh, we have in the past, when asked, we Okay, assisted. so it isn't something you take up a lot of time. It's usually, if someone was arrested, you would do some kind of internal investigation on that, or no? Yes, absolutely. How would you find out if an employee was arrested? It's usually reported to us by, by the courts that they get arraigned in. Really? <clears throat> hmm. How do they do that? Well, right at the book and procedure, you have to tell people what you do for work. You know? And, and they say things. it in court. And then how does that get translated to the city hall or to you if they say it in court? We, we, we usually receive information from another police department that an arrest has been taking place. Uh, it's happened in neighboring communities, uh, going back to issues you're talking to, you know, like domestic issues, that, that, we have, um, that we have certain mandates that we will follow through after that. Are you aware of the EMT's requirement, that there's a requirement for EMT's, if they're arrested for anything, to self-report to their um, license um, holding institution? And then typically the, that agency takes the permit and puts it like on suspension until the decision is, the outcome of that arrest happens. Do you know about that? I talked to someone who runs an ambulance company um, and is a management and that was what they told me and then I looked it up and so I'm wondering do you do you know have you heard of this and what do you feel about that there there may be different requirements for different licensing um, even even uh, all, all kinds of different licensing may have different requirements I just I, I'm really not up on that because I have no EMTs yeah. Within the Brockton but Police there Department. But there isn't a requirement that the Brockton Police Department report any arrest to their superiors. Or do you think that might be a neat, a good, healthy ordinance to pass or to discuss in the coming year, that broad arch of, a, of well, a protection I, I'm, to I'm, the general public? I'm trying to follow along with where you're going. You're talking about their superiors. You're talking about city personnel or you're talking, talking in the private about, sector? I'm talking about city personnel. So if, a, and not just any city personnel, any city employee who has, um, is given uh, permission to enter residents' homes in, uh, to, in the course of their job. So that would be like police, fire, it would be like DPW folks. There would be a list that would come up of people that have those types of entree into people's homes and general broad structure put out that if someone was arrested for a violent crime, drug offense, drug addict, or anything like that, um, they would be put on some sort of um, removed duty from interaction with public. I, you, I, I can understand what you're saying. Um, we, we, we do, well, what we, do you think? What we have, anyone that's arrested, anyone that's arrested by the Brockton Police Department, we learn of it. Okay? Uh, obviously, the, the appointing authority, the mayor's office, is notified immediately, as well as the uh, personnel office. And, and it's addressed from there. Um, on a non-criminal but administrative aspect, which would run parallel at the same time with the court case. 
And as it's running parallel, there's, you know, there's issues with contracts and due process. Sure. But uh, there would be notification made immediately. So I really like that. I think it's wonderful. So if we were to put a broad ordinance together that required employees who gained entree into people's homes in these sensitive job criteria to be put on some kind of duty other than going into the community and into people's homes, you might support something like that? Because I, I would like to form some kind of ordinance in the new year and a committee that looks at that as like a outside protection for any employee that goes into people's homes. Oh, I, I got to tell you, we already have the notification in place. Great. I mean, from the, I can speak so for the police department. So we could really use what you have in the police department oh, we as would a make model. That, we would make that notification because as, as a city department, we, we have a duty to notify the personnel office and the mayor's office uh, immediately upon any arrest. But what about the person arrested in Georgia? What about the person arrested in Georgia? Uh, Did, uh, the, arrest, the arrest would not have to be in, in, in Brockton, let's say, but if we learned of, of a city employee being arrested elsewhere, of course if we would follow If you learned it. about it, of course you would, but what I'm saying is how do we, like EMTs, enact this re self-reporting requirement? How could we enact a self-reporting requirement on, on all city employees that have sensitive job levels that requires them to self-report to the Human Resources Office if they were arrested for a violent crime, drug offense, or anything like that. So then we know that we can enact that non-criminal um, review for citizens as well. Uh, I mean, employees who are not police officers that are in these sensitive job um, criteria areas, such Correct. as DPW, fire. There may be some licensing with that. I, I know you keep referring to the EMTs, and I and I, there I is. can't. That's the I thing. can't. I can't speak There's to that because I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 can only, I can only speak to what we have in place. Yeah, and, I and like all yours. The, although we have um, it, everything that we have, and, and you know, communication, communication be, be, between police departments is, uh, is very quick. Uh, now with, uh, with all the computers in the, this day and age, um, it's, it's a very small world. Is, um, is this policy that you just talked about, is that on paper anywhere? Where this is the policy, if someone is arrested, we report it to the mayor's office and the um, the director of personnel's office. No, I, I was referring to all the prohibited conduct and the rules and regulations um, of the police department. There, there, there are rules and, and regulations of conduct, both on yep. duty and off duty. And, and any of violation of those, in essence, is a violation that would be reported, uh, whether it's criminal, administrative, or uh, oftentimes both. So that's part of the police officer's rules of conduct. Correct, our rules so and regulations. Could, we could implement some sort of rules of conduct through an ordinance that um, put those same types of requirements on employees in different departments that had inter sensitive, intimate access to residents' homes, well, right? The, we could the, do that. The rules and regulations that the Brockton Police have are, are part of our uh, policies and procedures, which, again, we go back to it's been bargained in the past. Okay. And, um, it, you know, it's been well established. And some of the things that I'm talking to you about, Councilor Rob, predates my 28 years oh, on the sure. police department. Oh, sure. I think that's great. So um, that's what we've had in yeah. place. Yeah, I think that's great. So, um, and it works for you. Yeah, I, 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 I haven't, uh, I can't speak of any, any failings that come to mind uh, from it. Yeah. It's, it's been, it's been, a, a, it's been, it's worked appropriately. So I guess um, I appreciate you being here tonight. There, I think it would have been nice if we had um, the DPW here to also hear what you say, but I bet they'll watch this, or maybe you can talk to them. Could you send me a copy of the rules and regula regulations and the policies and procedures by email and maybe to my fellow counselors so we can look at them as like models for the potential discussion around what we could implement with the other job classifications that have those yeah, intimate I can have that access? Sent. I, I can would have love that. Sent that. Over. Because then it would be coming from a standpoint of a police officer has looked into it and not just me thinking it's a good idea and we can look at other communities and how they do it. I'll, I'll send you over our rules and regulations. I really appreciate that. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Brophy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And through you to the council, um, is, is it the council's intention to postpone this matter to another date? 
I, I would really like to postpone it to another date uncertain till we find a time that's appropriate before the end of this, this um, session of ours in December that um, it wouldn't be too much of a bother to reconvene um, someone from the city solicitor's office and the DPW and then leave it open for the, for the people in the other departments, the police, the fire, and human resources, though I, I would love if Ms. Cruz could make it because she's really the expert in a lot of this. Um, to come, it would be great. You'd be welcome to. So that's that what I'd like to happen, answer. Mr. Mr. I would Sophie. hope that Ms. Cruz would come because I, I, I can wait till uh, the, the matter is heard again. But I do have some comments and questions. But I, I it, since this will be brought up at another date, I can uh, refrain and wait till that that happens. So okay, I'll, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll yield at this point. Thank you, Council Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is, is Ms. Cruz still here? I have a couple questions actually. Uh, in, in terms of uh, city, so the, the overarching conversation around city employees who have been accused or convicted of violent crimes, have, do we have a, a problem accused in the city? Accused and convicted are two different right. things. And or. Is, is that an issue in the city in terms of, is it a problem with, what were the numbers annually of incidents happening? Small amount. Okay. Small amount. We have not had many, many issues, but again, every one of them have been dealt with. And of those issues where someone has been accused or uh, convicted, have, have there been incidents of a city employee interacting with a resident that's led to an issue? No, with a resident, no. Not at all, okay. No. Um, and the question of, of a handbook or employee manual, you mentioned that, there, that that doesn't exist or it does exist for city employees? An employee manual? No, because there are different collective bargaining agreements. So the policies for uh, different unions, they differ from union to union. So, so there is no a manual because, again, you have to re they have to refer to their collective bargaining agreements, so some of those policies. Okay. So the expectation is that the employee reads The employee the is supposed to get a copy of their collective bargaining agreement okay. from their union membership. They pay dues. That's part of what their dues pays for. So they're supposed to get a copy of that from their, okay. their union. The city doesn't supply it. Is that, is that typical for a city not to have employee handbooks? Regardless of the number of unions that may exist in the city, it seems a little, it piqued my interest that that doesn't exist here in Brockton. Is that typical of a municipality not to have employee handbooks? In some municipalities, yes, because of the variety of job titles, collective bargaining. Uh, some employees are only covered by city ordinance. Mm -hmm. so. Mm. So that's there are some communities, there are many that have employee manuals, there but are. some of them just tell you to refer to uh -huh. collective bargaining agreement. And is there a reason why Broxton decided not to provide that as a framework for employees? Well, I would have to say partly because of um, budget constraints mm -hmm. and staffing. Mm -hmm. That would be something that the personnel department would have to do, and with a staff of two people to work on something like that it's a very difficult task to get accomplished. Mm -hmm. You'd need money and more staff to get something like that accomplished. I wonder if that's something that can be charged to each department head as a responsibility within that department with guidance from personnel. But it's something worth pursuing. I just piqued my interest and so I'll look into that further. But I was just curious. All right, well, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor. Councilor Ineri. Mr. President, I might say, um, just a um, um, couple of, uh, I don't know, Comments, I guess I would, I would, I'd rather, I'd like to make because, in, and I follow what you're saying, Ms. Cruz, in regards to uh, uh, some of the things that we would um, definitely have to do. But um, also, I guess back to my my colleague from Ward Six, I understand what she's trying to to get at and to try to get accomplished something, I guess, that would cover the status that I guess people wouldn't be afraid of. I don't know some of our employees, and I hate to use that word because I don't think it's the right way to the right way to go. And uh, I'm sorry to see that, that Chief Francis got upset tonight. I don't think anybody should have to come to the council change, chambers and, and, and get upset and be all worked up about, um, and he was right, you know, defending his department. I don't think that's the, the right way to go. I think, um, I think the council does need to postpone it and we need to look at it a little bit more closer and a little bit more in detail. And then when we're doing that, I think we also have to have the mayor present or mayor elect because I think you're talking this to be more of an executive branch um, situation than you do a city council situation. Because I think in my handbook as a city councilor, 
I do not hire, I do not fire, I do not reprimand. I appropriate funds to make sure the city works and works the right way. So if we're going to look at this in a, in a more thorough, thorough look and look at all guidelines, which would be general laws, you know, we'd also have to look at what um, civil service rules and regulations are. Uh, we keep in, you know, just this building separate from the other building across the street where everybody says, well, they've got it great over there, which they, they do somewhat, but still they're still employees of the city. I just think that if we're going to look at it the right way and try to write an ordinance, which is probably going to have to be deal, probably looked at as a case by case by case type of situation. I mean, you're gonna, this isn't something you're going to just do overnight. But I think you also have to have the executive branch person here because that's the person that dictates back to the department heads, not me. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But that's the way I look at it. So I, I hope that we're, we are going to postpone it, and I hope we, we look at it a little bit more thoroughly. But let, let's have the right person or persons here and that's up to however the council of Ward 6 or whoever she wants to invite, but it's, it's something I think needs to be done. So thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Anybody else before Council Dubois? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to postpone this this evening. Ms. Cruz, if you could make it to the following hearing, it would be great. But if you can't, we'll be sad. So it would be great. If we, could, if we can set a time that works for you, that isn't too much pressure, and then we can ask um, the city I always solicitor. attend when invited, Councillor, unless there's some emergency. I know you do. You're pretty great. So I don't mean it in any type of bad way, but I still want you to feel comfortable with it. And then um, in, include um, Mayor Belzotti to come in as an invited guest as well. Um, Mr. So Cruz, I would like to uh, postpone this to a non-definite date and um, leave everyone that's on the invited list on the invited you list. Know, that doesn't have to be part of the motion. We can okay. make the invitation. And that's all I would like to do. The motion to postpone. Second. Yes. Motion made and seconded to postpone. All those in favor? Postponed. Thank, Thank you very you. much, everybody. Item number eight. <clears throat> Resolved that the students from Stonehill College classes on climate, science, and environmental ethics be invited to appear before a committee of this council to make her presentation on climate change. Invited Kristen Buckholder, Teaching Fellow, Environmental Science, Susan Mooney, Professor of Biology, Environmental Studies, Program Director. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, Let's do it. Uh, I filed this resolve. Uh, and I'm very excited to have Stonehill students come and present to us uh, not simply the science behind uh, climate change, but how it impacts. Um, Brockton today and the future and how the city can use this information for better planning. Um, I would like to ask Professor Mooney if she could just come up and um, introduce the group and the class and I know that you guys have worked diligently on a presentation that's really focused on um, providing uh, this council with some concrete next steps that we can take as a city uh, to minimize our impact on the environment but also make better business decisions uh, as a government as it relates to climate change. Uh, so with that said, I'll, I'll have uh, Professor Mooney um, lead, lead us off here. Um, well, thank you. Um, uh, so my colleague Christy Burkholder and I have been uh, teaching a uh, class of 24 students uh, all semester long on climate change, the science of it and also what we can do about it and what we ought to be doing about it. Um, and so this team of students has done some really good research into the situation, the way climate change is affecting Brockton, and also what opportunities are out there to help the city plan for it and address it, including resources. So um, they're pretty good at introducing themselves, so I think if that's okay, I'll let them Excellent. take over there. Ready to go. Okay, thank you. There's no objection? All right. Good evening, and thank you for having us. Uh, before we get into it, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the members of the group and to explain our purpose. Uh, so my name is James Conley. I'm a sophomore at Stonehill College. I'm a history major and a secondary ed minor. My name is Chris Astafin. I'm a junior at Stonehill, and I'm an environmental engineering major. I'm Karen McKenney. I'm a sophomore at Stonehill. I'm an English major and secondary education minor. So as it's already been said, we've been in this classroom studying climate science and the effects that we can expect to see our changing climate have on the community around us. It's also been our purpose to look to see uh, opportunities that communities have in order to improve this situation and better their community. So we've come here today prepared for you a brief exclamation, explanation of uh, the climate change we're seeing and a few recommendations that we have for the city of Brockton to move forward with. Um, 
In order to stay timely, we're going to only touch on a few, uh, the ones that we feel are most important for Brockton and that we can expect to see most important. Um, going around right now, there's a handout. We're going to focus primarily on the front of the handout. The back has a few scientific diagrams that we will use to explain uh, if it's required further explanation. So I'm now going to pass it over to Chris, who is going to discuss green communities. Thank you, James. Um, so one resource we've looked into that will help Brockton better prepare for climate change and also help the city save money while preparing for climate change is the Green Communities Program. It's a Massachusetts state program in which the goal of it is to help cities and towns um, become more energy efficient while reducing their carbon impact and also strengthen the communities and uh, boost the economy while doing so. Uh, so far, the program has about 110 cities that have collectively received $20 million in state grants. Over the past three years, the program has been in state. And so to become a green community and participate and receive grants from the state, a city must re uh, meet five criteria which are outlined on the handout we have given you. The first criteria is to provide zoning and locations for renewable energy uh, and alternative energy generation, um, manufacturing, and research and development. And in the city, uh, Brockton already has the Brightfields, which generates electricity uh, by solar power and also houses the Cape Verde uh, wind project. So those would help the city fulfill that criteria. The second criteria is to facilitate and expedite applications for these renewable energy facilities and programs, and specifically for renewable and alternative energy facilities. Uh, the application process should take no longer than one year, it states. The third is to establish a baseline energy use uh, of the city, including the buildings, vehicles, and traffic lights. And after that is established, in state a five-year plan to reduce that energy use by 20%. And there are resources in the community, such as self-help, that will uh, help Brockton reduce their energy use uh, for all three of those parts. The fourth criteria is to require all departments in the city to start buying fuel-efficient vehicles. And um, one of those examples would be the hybrid buses that the, BT, the BAT was able to purchase a few years ago with uh, government money. And the last uh, criteria is to require energy efficient building practices by adopting a new building code, which would require buildings, uh, residential, commercial, and industrial buildings to be more energy efficient, conserve water, and incorporate technology of the uh, renewable and alternative energy technology. And that would be easy to fulfill as uh, Massachusetts State Building Code has an appendix in it, which the city could adopt to require that building code. And to do so, we have a contact uh, who will help the city in taking part in this program. His name is Seth Pickering. And he is a regional coordinator who will help the city meet these criteria and go through the application process for becoming a green community. And the deadline for which is the fall of every year. And he will help the city take steps towards that if the city wishes to pursue it. And we've also included the uh, website for the green communities, which has a lot more information on it. And just to give a few examples of what the city could expect uh, from joining and participating in this program, um, for the example, Springfield, uh, similar to Brockton in a few ways, they've received $1 million in the past few years to uh, replace water boilers in their uh, school systems with more energy efficient ones and also in state an energy management system. Uh, similarly, the city of Lowell has received three quarters of a million dollars for similar initiatives. And also Easton has received a quarter of a million dollars to replace all of their street lights with more energy efficient LED lights, which reduce energy use in the city and also make the streets brighter and safer. 
And then I would like to hand it over to Karen, who will talk more about climate change and how it affects Brockton. So I'll be discussing some of the science about why green communities are becoming more popular around and movements, green movements such as them. And so, uh, first of all, climate change is real. That's the main point that we'd like to make. And climate is defined as a weather of a region over a period of time, usually at least a decade. And some changes that we're seeing are mostly in temperature increase and precipitation increase. So the IPCC, which is the International Panel for Climate Change, is now saying with 97% certainty that climate change that we're seeing is human caused. So a few of these causes that we're seeing are in carbon emissions and the burning of fossil fuels. And so um, this is a problem because this is, these are things that we are doing and carbon in the atmosphere acts as a greenhouse gas, which means that it's an insulator or like a blanket in the atmosphere that keeps the atmosphere warm and uh, keeps all that energy in without letting it uh, get out. And so this is uh, heating the globe and it is leading to sea level rise and more intense temperature or more intense storms. And it's estimated for the uh, Boston area that by 2050, there will be one to two feet of sea level rise. And this is caused by two main reasons, which are thermal expansion and the melting of land ice. And thermal expansion is when the molecules in the, the ocean waters heat up and are moving faster. And so this causes them to expand and they then take up surface that was previously dry land on the coastlines. So this is important to Brockton because one of the main water sources is Silver Lake, which is located in Kingston, which is a more coastal town than Brockton is. And as the sea level continues to increase, that also increases the possibility of contamination in the fresh water. And um, so this is a big problem that we're seeing. And the second problem is that we are seeing more intense storms. And so with warmer atmospheres, um, it's evaporating more uh, surface water and then the water is uh, being absorbed and then released in uh, larger amounts. So instead of seeing frequent small storms that we're used to, we will now be seeing less frequent uh, but more intense storms. And so we know that this is already a problem in Brockton that uh, there's a lot of flooding that has been occurring recently. And um, so with more intense storms, we'll just be seeing more of that. And there are steps that can be taken that um, other communities are doing, uh, such as Philadelphia, and um, things that can be done in order to um, help prevent the damage that could be done instead of fixing it in the aftermath. And so James is now going to step up for a short conclusion. So it's our hope that after this short presentation, uh, we provide you with some information that can help you and the rest of Brockton move forward in preparing for what we can expect to see with our changing climate uh, in the situations of the flooding and the extreme uh, storms. We also hope that uh, we provided you the information to become a part of this green community so that Brockton, like your neighboring communities, can start to see some of these uh, financial benefits and also um, move forward in making your community more green. We will now open the floor for any questions. Yes, let's do it. Mr. Chairperson, um, I also believe, too, well, first of all, thank you again for the presentation and your focus on Brockton. Um, and I think it's very useful for the City Council and those who are watching to know that um, we can have a positive impact on the negative influences of uh, climate change. Um, I, I also believe, too, that in your, pres your extended presentation, there was talk of longer, drier summers, uh, in addition. Um, and so, uh, as you know, the city has contracted with um, Aquaria, which is uh, a desalinization plant to take salt water and make it turn into um, drinkable water. Uh, have you guys done any studies on the these longer, drier summers and how that impacts communities in terms of water costs, the impact on potential water bans, and you know, what position is Brockton in in the future with this? desal agreement that we have at the moment? Um, we can't speak to the amount of costs that these longer drier summers could have as far as water resources are concerned. Um, we can say that we have seen already uh, in the Great Lakes area there's a ban on exporting any of their water outside of the Great Lakes area so only communities that are directly uh, connected to the Great Lakes can get <laughs> this water. Also with the longer, drier summers, we won't see the um, snowfall that we typically expect to replenish our surface water and aquifers. Uh, so that will no longer be present uh, with these longer, drier seasons. 
And then my second question, um, the opposite of drier summers, the, the more intense storms in the winter, um, and we've seen some of those um, recently, and the, the budgetary impact on the city of having to plow through those winters. Um, so same question, question, but different scenario. Um, have you guys done any, have you investigated at all the impact on the budget for cities with these more intense storms and what, how, what implications that may have for Brockton's budget at all that we can extrapolate from examples in other places? In looking at uh, some of those issues, uh, there was, I think it was Middleborough, a uh, nearby city, in which uh, one of the in more intense storms of recent years, they went through most of their snow removal budget with the first storm alone because it was so intense with so much snow that had to be dealt with. So with having those more intense storms every year, there could be an increased um, need of more budget sent to snow removal with these storms. Okay. Um, because I think that's overlooked in this whole climate change discussions, the sort of on the ground financial implications for cash strapped cities like Brockton and how we better plan for uh, the next five years or 10 years in terms of the impact on uh, delivering local services in that way. Um, I'm going to yield the floor and if my colleagues have questions, uh, let them uh, do so. But once again, I think this is a really good first step in having the city think more about the, the impact of the weather on our, again, our very limited budget and how we plan for that looking moving forward, both in terms of the longer summers and the more intense winters. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Brophy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, thank you. It was a great presentation. Uh, I think the city of Brockton needs to look more to our neighboring uh, colleges and universities for input on issues like this. And I'm um, very proud that um, my uh, members from my, my college, Stonehill College, made uh, a presentation tonight as, as a proud alum. Clearly uh, a much better caliber of student now. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yes, I would agree with that, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, I just have a few questions. Um, one thing that Brockton, when we went through um, many, many years of, of water restrictions by the state, uh, because the Silver Lake was not a sufficient uh, amount of water at that time to, to meet our needs in the state, basically um, prevented the city from expanding. There were uh, um, buildings, uh, projects weren't allowed to be built because we were on the strict water uh, restrictions at, the, at that time. And one of the things the state required the city to do was uh, uh, increase its conservation efforts. And the city did. And the city uh, uh, met those um, conservation efforts uh, and the residents went, went were uh, also in agreement with it, and we saved uh, millions of gallons of water just through conservation. So uh, the, the green communities situation, I think, is something that, that Brock would be willing to do. But there's a couple of questions I have. Uh, um, as you indicated, Brockton is already moving forward we, we, uh, with uh, locations for renewable energy. We have the solar fields over on Grove Street, which was a major uh, accomplishment for the city, and we've committed to the five-year plan to reduce energy. Uh, and uh, phase in fuel efficient vehicles. One of the things that I think could be a concern, however, in the facilitation of applications for renewable energy facilities, I believe one of the requirements for a green community is to allow uh, permitting of these facilities without having to go to the zoning board or the planning board, correct? Do you know if that's a requirement? I didn't see if that was a, a requirement or not. I just know that. Um, the processes for these applications and these projects to be expedited and uh, go through the process much quicker than other energy facilities. So it's not an as right permitting, they still would have to go through some permitting process? I believe so. Yes. That, that there are some, like the, the Grove Street neighborhood uh, welcomed the solar facility with open arms, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago almost. Uh, and. Um, we would like to see more projects like that in the city, but we also have to keep in mind that uh, we have to put these in neighborhoods. I know that, that there have been several communities that are challenging wind facilities, the, 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 the wind farms, and claiming that there are detrimental health effects as a result of that. I don't know 
what the science is on that and whether or not there is a connection between the, uh, the, uh, the medical complaints that people who live within the vicinity of the, the, the wind facility have, it, what the relationship is to the, the, the noise or, or the motion that they claim causes the adverse health effect. But that is something we as um, city councilors, we have to uh, make sure that our constituents' uh, concerns are met. So I, I would just have some reservation in regard to expediting permitting. I want to make sure that uh, my constituents, are, uh, their, their concerns and needs are met. But I think it's something that the city should look, uh, look into in the future, look, uh, since we are taking some strides that would qualify us as a, as a green community. So, and I don't know if you know what the effect would be if we went down this road to become um, a green community. Uh, you're aware that there is uh, a proposal to site a 350 uh, gas-fired, uh, um, 350 megawatt gas-fired uh, power plant here in the city. Do you know what effect that would have on Brockton if it, it chose to apply uh, for this uh, green communities uh, designation? I don't think the, that power plant would have any effect on meeting the criteria for becoming a green community. I think the main focus of the green community is meeting those five criteria on top of everything else Brockton already does. Okay. It, it would just seem somewhat contradictory to move forward as a green community and take a step back uh, as, uh, to allow a plant like that in the city. Yeah, and that's why um, one of the criteria is to make energy facilities such as um, the solar fields uh, easier to and quicker to do than other facilities like that. I know that the people who uh, have stated their opposition to the uh, power plant that they would welcome, some would welcome uh, these green uh, uh, solutions as opposed to that. So so much for your presentation. I appreciate it. And I'm sure that my, my colleagues do as well. Uh, and you did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Dubois. Thank you. I think you did a great job too. So thank you for coming and explaining this to everybody at home and us here. So good job. I love hearing about the environment. So welcome. Can you tell me what's happening in Philadelphia? You said what is what Philadelphia is doing. What's Philadelphia doing? It's so awesome. Yes, so Philadelphia has also been experiencing many flood problems similar to Brockton. And so they've recently um, upped a lot of their regulations and laws uh, about um, flood the sewage and things like that and uh, flood removal. And so one of the things that they're doing is trying to implement um, land water um, sort of gardens and to better their drainage systems so as to allow this water to drain better and so that it doesn't end up ruining their sewers as, an, as a I result and clogging up their streets as well. Excellent. Oh, that's wonderful. Is there more to it? Is that, what, is that good? Because that sounds great to me, but I don't want to cut you off. No, that's, that's about all we know. So that's far, great. So. Um, what are the renewable energy sources approved um, under this, this uh, green communities? What, which, what is the definition of a renewable energy source? Uh, so a renewable energy source would um, be like wind uh, would be a good source of renewable energy, uh, solar, uh, geothermal, uh, tidal, and also um, alternative energy sources like uh, biomass and biofuels would also be under that distinction. So oil refineries is a no. No oil refineries. How about gas fire power plants? <laughs> so no oil refineries and no gas powered gas powered power plants are renewable. They're both bad for the environment, correct? Yeah. That's it's an kind agreement. Of above. <laughs> They're the experts of these green community. Good job, kids. That's the whole point. So um so that's true, right? They're less um they create less carbon that the renewable energy sources create less carbon that gets trapped in, in our atmosphere by the blanket of pollution. And they make our community less hot and less, we'll have less um, tornadoes and sandy events and what's happening in Illinois more this season. Do you think climate change is, a, is associated with all the tornadoes that are happening in recent years? Is uh, there a link there? 
We can't state uh, individual weather incidents are directly related to climate change, okay. but what we can expect to see with uh, climate change is an increase in extreme weather events. So these events would be examples of extreme weather events, but we cannot tell you with 100% certainty that these tornadoes are um, right. well, climate change caused. Great. I just have one more question. Sure. So it's another follow-up to the Great Lakes thing. So you said the Great Lakes has uh, some kind of law ordinance, I don't know what, about not exporting water. So yes. they mean bottled water? Do they mean water that rolls down the river? Or do they mean only communities on the river that can get that water? So if you're like two cities removed, can you not access that water? Or what is that all about? Um, I I'm not positive as far as the range that okay. it, it stretches. I do know that they do not export their water to outside communities. Um, and this would become a situation where if a community that does export their water uh, feels that they would not uh, have enough water to support their own community, they would continue, uh, they would stop the continuation of exporting their water. Yeah. So this is something that we wanted to make sure that Brockton was aware of it. Really um, interesting. Because they do, yeah, you do receive a lot of your water from external sources. How long sources. has that been in law? Like how long is this law that you, I'm going to look into this because it's very interesting, but how long has it been in effect? Has this been in effect for a long time? Or is this something that they used to export their water and then one day they got some court that said no longer they need to do it? Do you know? Uh, I do not know. Because that that's excellent stuff. information and I appreciate it because we're worried about our water source and there are, there is uh, the Mon Ponset Pond uh, folks um, saying that we shouldn't be taking their water anymore, and that is something that's currently going on right this second. I don't know if you guys knew about it, because it's kind of just blooming off to the side, where the state rep from that area, where our water source is, not in Brockton, wants us to stop getting water from them, because they think we're getting it for zero dollars and we're taking their resource even though we have the city center and that's why everybody lives here so everybody has to help or all us people are going to move to where the water source is, right? Because like the olden days. So this is the trouble that Brockton's in right now and the fact that you brought this example of some, some community that's no longer exporting their water is, gonna, is making me think I need to look more into it. I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, so Stuart. Mr. Chairman, uh, so once again, thank you very much. I enjoyed coming to Stonehill College earlier in the week, last week, uh, to see the extended presentation and would encourage my colleagues to connect with you if they are interested in more information. Uh, with Professor Mooney, what I'm really excited about is um, you guys approached uh, the City Council uh, with the work you were doing, but I do believe there are projects in the city where we can use the, the academic expertise of Stonehill and particularly your department uh, and would love to try to figure out where those intersections are um, to better to put in place better planning for the city. Uh, I'm in particular concerned about the, the trends of flooding in the city and I've had DPW come before the council to kind of think through what is the city's strategy for dealing with it and frankly from those conversations there's no strategy in place and I think partly because we just don't have the, the thought partnership to kind of figure that out. I would love to see if that is a project uh, that your, your classes would be interested in help us, helping us think through as a city um, and working with the new administration to move forward on that. wonderful to get more collaboration happening, not just between us, you know, Stonehill and, and the city, but also with Massasoit and with Bridgewater State. I think that the three campuses really would like to work together to help the city on some of these issues. We, we have um, an environmental science major now at Stonehill and a growing number of students doing things like Chris with the environmental engineering. He'll be leaving us after the end of this year to go two years at Notre Dame to get the environmental engineering degree. Um, but we're getting more and more students that have the expertise and, and the issue of, of urban, urban flooding is a huge one that many cities have dealt with and there has been a lot of really great, some very low tech things you can do and some others that are more complicated like permeable paving uh, projects and things like that. So there are ways to make it much less likely for the streets and people's basements to be flooding in some of these uh, storm events. So, um, so maybe, you know, we maybe know that but we'd need to Obviously, we don't understand a lot of things about how to run a city, but we know about that, those kinds of attempts and we'll be glad to help. I, I appreciate that. Okay. I have a question for uh, Mr. Condon. Uh, if we were to solve some of the flooding problems,
problems in the neighborhoods? Because that, that directly impacts the insurance rates of those residents, right? In terms of lower home insurance rates or no? I'm just trying to ask that question again, please. I want to make sure. Right. I so if we were able to solve some of the flooding issues in the city, particularly in those locations where there's repeat flooding, yes. that impacts Yes. the homeowner's insurance rates, correct? Yes, and I think probably in an increasing way over time it's look, looking like it's, it's going to be, get to be more and more, more and more expensive. Right. So, uh, you know, tonight you folks approved a 2.7 meg uh, solar it's contract. Very exciting. Yes. You've got a You've got a solar field, which <laughs> is our own solar field, which generates over three megs a year, and you've already approved two other contracts, which are, I think are about six and a half meg in total. I mean, that adds up to, uh, I think, over 10 megawatts plus that the city of Brockton either owns or is directly supporting uh, through its financing. So it's not, and you just approved a couple of years ago a $36 million project, which is uh, financed 80% uh, by the MSBA, uh, the school uh, building authority. But uh, it was a green project as well, and 20% of that cost was the city's cost. So it's, it's not as if we're doing nothing. We're, we are we're doing a lot in a lot of areas, I think. I think we are, and certainly the students recognize that in your report about wh what we're doing right, and I'm excited that there's momentum here and that we can build on it with, uh, with a partnership with Stonehill and the other academies. So well, thank you again for your presentation, your work on this. We're useful and look forward to uh, trying to firm up some kind of partnership moving forward, specifically for me uh, on the issue of flooding, but there are obviously other areas as well. Uh, I'd like to, to motion have this sent to the full city council favorably. Second. Motion made and second, second and to recommend to the city council favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Item number nine. Resolved that the mayor, chief financial officer, and the personnel director be invited to appear before a committee of this council to discuss limitations on contracts being presented to the city council for a period of six months prior to a city election. Invited Honorable Mayor Linda M. Belzotti, Johnny Condon, chief financial officer, Maureen Cruz, director of personnel. Council Stewart. Mr. Chairperson, um, I think this was reported accurately in the paper, and I followed the conversation in the paper around um, this intent, which is principally to look at when contracts are not necessarily negotiated, but when they're brought before the city council for a vote and just had some concerns about um, <coughs> having those contracts come in a, an election cycle, which uh, to me places undue pressure to vote in some cases in favor of those contracts when you have a room stacked with city employees who want those contracts to take place. Uh, and I think we're all independently thinking people, but at the same time, we're all, um, we, we all have, we have the potential of, of um, succumbing to pressure, is pressures in that way. And then secondly, even the, the perception of voting on those contracts in a political season, whether that intent is real or not, the perception could be that um, uh, the city is using tax dollars to ensure that certain people get back in office, which is just not healthy, I believe, in terms of our um, our interaction with the community. So I wanted to um, start the conversation here, hoping that if um, you know it makes sense that this moves toward an, an ordinance that we then send to the ordinance committee to investigate further. But okay. for me, this is really just to kind of start the conversation. I want to get your your opinion on. The well, I, I I appreciate the uh, the motivation. I understand the concern because I think each of you, which is voting on uh, spending taxpayers' dollars, and especially in an election cycle, it's always a matter of concern that you know is there is there some quid pro quo here under the table, which isn't wasn't which isn't apparent in the actual contract itself, and uh, the larger contracts involve the expenditure of a lot of money. So I, I can understand, and especially in a time when uh, funding is tight for all kinds of purposes, which most councils would like to see us do more in terms of services than we're doing right now. And taxpayers are pressed as well. So you've got a bunch of conflicting elements going on there. Uh, the problem I have is that um, we're bound by a particular statute to negotiate in good faith. And we don't know when we're going to reach resolution on those negotiations. You know, in the case of the the last series of contracts, we were at the table for about three years before we came to resolution. So we might have come to resolution earlier and brought it before the council in the first year of a council sitting, and we might not have come through this time with a successful contract negotiation and maybe come to you in, instead next year. And in fact, with the police union, as I indicated earlier, that's the position we are in. So what isn't known is when will we be 
at resolution and able to bring it to the city council. And I don't think we can say, well, we're getting close to a, a deadline in, a, in an election year and therefore we have to stop negotiating. We need to keep going until we're either successful or we're not successful. That leaves the funding entity, the legislative branch, in a difficult spot. I understand that. Now all of a sudden something is brought to you and you know, you're know you asked, make a vote here and you're standing for election. It isn't simply the mayor who's standing for election, but usually a substantial part of the city council also is standing for election and it can be a little bit uncomfortable to have to make that vote. But my recommendation is that you make the determination as that vote comes to you on the merits of what's brought to you. If you think it is more than is um, affordable, you've got the right to vote no, either individually and certainly as a body, you've got individually you've got the right, but as a body, if you reject it, you reject it. If you don't feel it's the kind of thing that could be dealt with at this point, you've got the right to postpone as a, as a body. You can table it and basically by so doing, the, the issue dies. Um, one of the things that uh, maybe some of you weren't aware of, uh, I think some of you who've been around a longer time would be, but if we reach an agreement in the executive branch with the union and bring it to the city council for funding, and if the funding is required to make the contract go forward, at least the financial elements of it, and it doesn't get the funding vote during the election season, the new mayor, if it's a new mayor taking, as we have this year, uh, mayor replacing an incumbent, that new mayor isn't bound by that contract. So had you chosen to not, say, fund the fire contract or to postpone it or to table it, that contract would not have been binding on the, uh, on the new mayor. Were we to reach an agreement with the police union and we were at the table, you know, when the fire contract um, uh, came before you last summer, you know, it wasn't discussed, but it's also true that the police contract was on, in negotiations and we weren't able to reach an agreement with the police union on the basis of the contracts that we had with the other unions. I don't want to go further than that because we're still at, at the table with them, but uh, the point is not every contract settles because each is a separate negotiation. Not every contract settles on the cycle that we'd like it to settle. And had we reached an agreement with the police union, say now, uh, this mayor wouldn't have brought it forward anyway. I don't think she would have felt that was appropriate. But have we reached an agreement with this police union now? This council could have said, well, this is just isn't right to vote out. You know, we have a new mayor coming in. And it wouldn't be binding on the next mayor because it wouldn't have been funded. So you have a fair amount of power at your disposal anyway, which is the right to vote yes or no or to do nothing. Um, I, I think as a matter of principle, it probably isn't a good idea to bring a, a matter to the council in the same time frame as the prohibition on making personnel appointments. But it, as a matter of law, I don't think that we're prohibited from doing it because the mayor's authority is unrestricted except where it is restricted until her term expires or his term and it's the same for a sitting council. So a mayor can't bring an appointment forward in the last 90 days in an election year, but it could bring a collective bargaining agreement forward. I'd be a little bit comfortable at, at that late date and the fire contract was getting perilously close to that, but it, it wasn't within that time frame. So that's my general feeling. I'm happy to work with you in any way that you think sets a, a better governing policy for the city in this, in this area, especially when finances are tight. It's less concerning when finances aren't as tight. Great. Um, that's, that's great. And so just so I understand in terms of the idea of negotiating it in good faith, when you, when the negotiating team comes to an, an agreement, how quickly does that contract come to the city council once that agreement is made? Well, that depends upon how complicated the contract was. In the case of the fire agreement, it took quite a while because it was two real different settlements and there was some, um, some complicated uh, non-economic language that had to be worked out. So we can reach agreement at the table, but we can't bring a, that agreement back uh, to the body for a vote until it's in final form and agreed to in language as well as principle. And that can take quite a while. In this last instance, it did. In addition, that contract, because it was looking back three years and looking forward three, it took a long time to cost. And that also can take, I mean, it's, it's one thing to have a sense that it's going to cost about $1.5 million for this year, but when we make an appropriation, it can't be, you know, within a ballpark. It has to be a little bit more specific mm -hmm. than that. And our unions are, um, their, um, their pay compensation is much more complicated than simply base wage, especially the public safety unions. They have a lot of pay elements, which are somewhat so that, dependent so that, on what... So that duration of, for that, the contract that you just mentioned, uh, the, the recent firefighters contract, as an example, 
uh, the date when that contract was agreed on in principle and the date that it was presented to the city council, what time expired? How much time expired? Um, I think it was a couple of months in determining the language and then another period of time when it had to get voted by the, uh, by the fire union. Okay, so is that, is that a three-month period, a four-month period? Uh, I don't think it was four, but I think it was three. By right, three. So it's so it, it is. And when it was finished, it was on the summer schedule for the city council. Right. Okay. So it is reasonable that, in terms of the idea of uh, negotiating good faith, that once the agreement is made in principle, there is a waiting period to work out the details. So that's not unusual. No. So, um, so if there were a moratorium on presenting information to the city council, and six months may not be the right amount of time, it could be three months or 90 days or whatever seems to be reasonable. But it seems to be fairly common practice that an agreement isn't made in principle and then the next day the city council sees the agreement. So there is a waiting period already sort of built in. Uh, yeah, it, it varies from contract to right. contract. And uh, I'm not a labor attorney. I, I don't know whether if we were to put some form of, uh, of, of actual barrier, legal impediment to concluding an agreement and bringing it to the council, whether we would, by that act itself, be in violation of, of Chapter 150. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I think you need a lawyer to ask, answer that. I think from a practical, practical perspective, this particular year is, is instructive because one agreement was brought to city council, uh, even though it was brought in in the summertime, but it was brought. And the other one, we haven't reached agreement, but were we able to? I don't know that we would have decided to finish those negotiations this close to the end of the fiscal year. It just didn't right. seem to be right. And in a, from a practical sense, I don't think we could have got it funded quickly if we came to a quick agreement. It would have been difficult. Right. And, and your comment about not bringing a, a, an agreement forward with a new mayor-elect is really not the issue that I'm trying to solve. It's making those decisions before an election. Yeah. before we understand if the, if the present mayor will be re-elected if there's a new mayor coming in and, and getting away from that artificial right. pressure, unnecessary pressure, which I think can easily cloud decision-making and probably for the worse rather than for the better. And I, I think you are right. We do understand. I think I understood that if we were to have tabled an agreement and that went beyond that fiscal year, that, that agreement is null and void. But again, tabling or postponing a vote on a contract is essentially saying no to those individuals who are looking for well, those. Well, no, I don't think that's, that's true, Council. What, what if, let's assume again it's a fire contract, and in August the City Council decided to table that agreement. Uh, basically, what you would have done is frozen it, until, unless you brought it off the table, but if it were tabled for the duration of your term, you would have frozen it. It didn't mean, it wouldn't mean that that agreement couldn't be brought back to the union with a new, because it'd have to be reintroduced with, with a new council, and say, uh, if the new mayor, current mayor re-elected or new mayor taking office could say, I can support that contract, let's put it back in. It would have simply frozen the matter in time. So it's not necessarily a no, it certainly isn't a yes, but right. it's not necessarily a no. I think in terms of practical purposes though, so technically it's not a no, but if you have a group, a body looking for an agreement to be made and you table that, that discussion, it's for all intents and purposes a no for them. And so that doesn't necessarily allay the body here from getting out of that trap of being, the perception of being pressured into making a decision. Right, but to some extent, Council, there's never really a good time to vote on these contracts. When the money is rolling in, it's one thing. But when the money isn't rolling in, whether you're voting it on the first, second, or third month of your term, or in the last year of your term, there's always opposition and there's always suspicion as to why were these contracts negotiated this way. I mean, I have a belief that there is a large part of the population which would be happy to see no increases for any of the city workers for quite a period of time because they don't want to pay, pay the, the freight for them. You know, they're happy to get the services, but they may think that we're overpaid or even if we're not overpaid, they simply can't afford to pay us more. And so whenever you bring that kind of a vote up, there's a certain part of the public which isn't going to like that, uh, like that vote, and, and that's the reason for it. They see it as a, as a tax increase for them, and you know, to some extent they're right. And I did look at, I did research on this issue before bringing it before the City Council and could not find any, and again, I, I'm, that was my initial research work, I could not find any Massachusetts law that would prevent the city from placing a, a moratorium on those contracts coming before us for a period of time. Um, are you aware of anything that, that a specific I, I, a specific prohibition? I think what I what I would wonder is whether you can bind the executive, which has an affirmative obligation to bargain in good faith. So that that's an affirmative obligation of the, of the collective bargaining statute on us. So whether you could 
create some ordinance which steps in front of our obligation to do that. I don't know. I mean, I just, I just don't know. I, I have suspicions about it, but again, I wouldn't rely on the uh, legal advice right. of the chief financial <laughs> officer. <laughs> I'd um, get an attorney's advice. Uh, fair enough. Um, I don't know if the personnel director has anything to add to the conversation, because what I'm hoping that we can do is, once again, represent this as, send this back favorably represented as an as a ordinance for the next city council and have those key questions answered. Um, but is there anything else that you think is, is worth mentioning? No, I believe this? Mr. Condon has hit everything um, that needed to be addressed. I do think that 150E, the, the mass general laws that we're obligated to bargain under, um, I think you'd need an attorney's uh, interpretation, but I, th I think that, that the city council couldn't bind the uh, chief executive officer from bargaining in good faith. Mm -hmm. I think you'd need to get that legal opinion. Okay. But other than that, I agree with Mr. Condon's comments. Okay. So I'll, I'll yield for additional questions of my colleagues. Um, thank you. Mr. Councilor Brophy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Condon, the 90-day prohibition on appointments is state law, correct? Yes. Yeah, and you know what? It makes sense. It, it, it uh, you know, the election's taken place, and it, it basically is to prevent midnight appointments. Correct. Is to prevent the outgoing mayor and city council stacking uh, uh, positions within the city, uh, allowing the new administration to come in and to make those appointments if, if, if those appointments are up or there are vacancies. So it makes sense. And, and what uh, I believe Council Stewart is, is presenting also makes sense. I think having a period where, um, where there, the, the contracts could not be approved or uh, go before the city council or, or negotiated during a certain period of time would also make sense. But I think it would require state law, and as a practical matter, something like that would never make it through the legislature. I think uh, as, as general state law, it would affect every community. There would be great resistance from all the unions within the, the yep. Commonwealth. And even a local home rule petition that would just affect Brockton and allow Brockton to do that would, would, would see great opposition because the, the, the uh, statewide unions would not want to see a foothold in any city with a prohibition like that. So I, I think it makes sense. We saw the situation in 2005 with the firefighters contract and the issue of residency. That was an outgoing mayor who, 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 who gave residency away. And in my opinion, if we had that, it's still as law, a full residency requirement during those next couple of years where we were talking about layoffs and could have negotiated, I think, significant concessions with the unions with that residency requirement. Mm -hmm. That would that left that incoming mayor in 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 a, in a worse position had the, the outgoing mayor had hadn't made that deal. So I think it makes sense. I agree with the council, but I think as a practical purpose, it's not going to go anywhere. And one thing and I don't ordinance, know. I think would be challenged, and I think unfortunately. Um, they, they, it probably would not survive but a challenge. It, it, I'm wondering as, a, as I'm listening to you whether it wouldn't be possible for the council to focus its ordinance on its own actions as opposed to the chief executive. Hmm. That's, that, that's something I think to hmm. look into. That, that, that may be the, the route we could take uh, the um, next year, um, have legislative council research that. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think we should have a restriction <laughs> on recognizing outgoing council. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're getting unanimous support for that. Nope. <laughs> Anybody else? Entertain a motion? Thanks. Just like that. It's a motion to have this sent back to the full council favorably, and I would, um, this is not part of the motion, but just for information purposes, um, have an ordinance reintroduced so that the ordinance committee can investigate this further in the next term. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend to the City Council favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you, Councilors. Councilors, I believe that's it. We're adjourned.